So Bismillahirrahmanirrahim ahmaduhu wa usalli ala rasulil kareem amma ba'd. So today inshallah we have a very special guest uh brother uh, Sayyid Hassan Ali right? And uh <clears throat> What where me and him connect is through our Sheikh Dr. Israhim Um and so he has uh, kind of like spent his life studying one aspect, which we're going to talk about about the the emergence of the social sciences and Quran and looking at Quran from different perspectives, and uh, he's really like. Uh, has a lot to contribute, mashallah. And so we're going to do a series. I don't know what to call the series. Maybe we'll call it uh, Islamic Renaissance or we'll call it Divine History, um, the first one. Revitalization of faith, maybe. Uh, okay. Uh, revitalization of faith, you're saying? Maybe. We maybe. can call it whatever you like, brother. Inshallah. Okay. <laughs> inshallah. So um, what are we going to discuss? We're going to discuss everything from history to the Mahdi in this case yeah well and, let's say we can do like a if we were going to be really comprehensive it's going to be on hadith jibrail and the tafsil of hadith jibrail but so much tafsil that you've never even heard of like we're going to go into the very litafa of iman and litafa of isan and the litafa and tafsil of litafa, all the, he means the subtleties okay subtleties and and the details the tafsil like the immense tafsil of all of these things that the prophet in his eloquence just you know spoke so simply but there's so much to exfold and, and explicate from each one of these uh each one of the answers that the prophet gave so so yeah so we're going to be looking at everything from the past to islamic eschatology in a way right the entire history and how it kind of has a divine framework um yeah. okay so so basically we're for uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the philosophical principles by which we could look at muslim history like wahadat al-wujud falsafa khudi integral theory degan's eurasianism and then we're going to go into biblical history there's a wisdom there's a composition there's a structure to biblical history, like the missile between Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sayyidina Musa Alaihi Wasallam, the missile between Imam al-Mahdi and uh, uh, Sayyidina Isa Alaihi Wasallam. By, and the by, by mithal, he means similarities. Okay, so yeah. there's there's a similarity between Prophet Musa and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is established by the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are many of them, actually, when you come to the Hadith literature. But as you know, Bani Israel will, has a very similar history to ours, right? So the beginning is very similar in, in a sense, and the ending is very similar in a very sense, because the ending is with Jesus and Jesus and the first prophets, Prophet Muhammad and Prophet, uh, Prophet, Muhammad and Prophet Musa have a lot in common. They both uh, died a natural death. They both did hijrah. They both did jihad. They both, uh, or, or Musa wanted to do jihad. Both had an ummah, both had a book, right? And uh, and so now, uh, towards the end of this Ummah, Bani Israel, you have Jesus, in which the ulama of B Bani Israel were opposing him. So you can expect the very same uh, towards the end. Um, yeah, so let's talk about these things in detail, the similarities between Prophet Muhammad and Prophet Musa and how the two Ummahs, because they're both about 1,000, the Ummah of Bani Israel is almost 1,500 some years. And then we are expecting the same thing from the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so I think that'll be a very interesting. So yes, please continue. Okay, so that that first we have like kind of the metaphysical uh, presuppositions of the whole discussion, right? And then kind of like the patterns and the theories that are important to have in mind as we're going through the discussion. And then we have this biblical history that uh, bro Brother Omar also, uh, Sheikh Omar also um, just spoke about in detail. And I think that's one of, he has more strength in speaking about particular hadith. He's more of a muhadith and I'm more of a mutakallim. So it'll be an interesting conversation that way. And then once we have that context of biblical history from Adam al Islam to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the meaningful patterns and wisdom of that, then we will continue on and look at Muslim history, like the mundane Muslim history after so Nabi reason, uh, I want to clarify the reason he's saying biblical history when it comes to the prophets is because our history of prophet comes from Israeliyat. 
It doesn't come from the Quran. The Quran gives us no sequence of prophets, right? It, it, it completely comes like the overall, meaning the Quran talks about this prophet and this prophet and this prophet, but it's only through the Bible that we're able to chronalize it and see at which point of Bani Israel, was it at the high point, was it a low point? Uh, are we able to like take that Israeliyat? And I think one of the greatest works of Imam Nikathir actually is that, you know, that he took the Israeliyat and said, okay, these fit the Quran. And, and so while it seems very basic to maybe uh, a scholastical person today, like what's the big deal, you know, these narrations, but it's actually a big deal to take these narrations and say, okay, these things of the Bible fit the Quran from that perspective. So, you know, there are two things that Ibn Kathir did. He took the opinions of Ibn Abbas's students, the opinion of Ibn Masud's students. So that's significant. And I think the third thing that he did that was really uh, significant was uh, he was really one of the main people that kind of like, I mean, there were other tafsirs uh, based upon Riwaya, like Tabari and the others before this, but this was like the first tafsir that actually dealt with Israeliyat. And this is why Imam Nikathir then wrote another book on Qasr al just on that topic. Anyway, sorry, but yes, please. Well, I think the next step, like you were saying, would be uh, then we'll move into Muslim history and it's the dialectics between um, Islamic idealism, uh, which is on the wazan of the Nasara, and Islamic uh, realism, which is on the Nasa, which is on the wasm of the Yehud, right? So the polarity between Kitab and Hikmah, right? We're going to look at that polarity and how it played out after Isa al-Islam within the Ummah of Sayyidina Musa al-Islam. So the Yehud and Nasara, their dialectic, how it played out. And then once Islamic history starts after Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how the same dialectic is playing itself out within our Ummah. And how how that's like the fractionation, the disintegrated process where the ummah is fractionating and disintegrating into all these sects. Um, and many of the sects that exist today have had baqa from the first century of the deen, right? So like uh, the whole spectrum that exists from the Zaydi, Shia, Itna, Shari, Sunni, all, many of these have had baqa from the very first century. So we're going to look at the hikmah of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the final ummah gave baqa to all this tafarqa. And just to give you a little bit of a teaser, um, for me, coming from a Wahadatul Wajud perspective and an integral theory perspective, it's basically that each firqa has a baqa because at its foundation, it has some haq has some hakikat that it is overemphasizing because the rest of the ummah has forgotten that hakikat. And in order for that hakikat to survive in the face of the rest of the ummah, they have to emphasize it extremely strongly. Mm -hmm. And when they emphasize that hakikat extremely strongly, what happens is they have to de-emphasize the other hakaik of the deen. And so the, the right thing to do is to, is to acknowledge each of these hakikat and provide the right the beak of them and provide the right uh, arrangement of them in, in relationship to each other. And so what, once we go through this analysis of first metaphysical historical principles, biblical history as the context, and then this full analysis of 1400 years of uh, ideological dialectics within the ummah, then we'll come to a place where we can actually uh, engage in what I call the ecumenical reconciliation of Muslim ideologies, where we move beyond, it's the reintegrative impulse. So we've had the disintegrative downward impulse, and now we're having the reintegrative purpose, uh, reintegrative impulse. And that's necessary because we, we cannot identify and fight each other anymore. We have to re-identify as Muslims and resolve these things that have divided us for so long. Mm. Yeah, this is a very good point. Um, so a lot of the groups that exist have something to offer that has something to do with haq is what you're saying, right? And uh, so we'll get into that because I think the whole idealism versus realism as a historical process is very interesting, actually, you know, and uh, this is kind of like the part of the polemics we have with each other, right? Um, so inshallah, we'll get into that. So, okay, so where do you want to start? And if any of you don't understand what he just said, we'll open this up as we're talking and, uh, and then I'll, I'll open it up for you guys as he's talking and make what he's trying to say a little bit more simplified. Okay. 
I have Asperger's. I like revealing that so everyone knows my like my way of communication can be out sometimes. So I'm just revealing that. So that part of me wants to go back to first principles and begin there. So I'm going to go back to Wahadat al-Wajud, but I'll try not to go too much into Wahadat al-Wajud. There's only two sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I want to talk about from, from a Wahadat al-Wajud perspective, right? And so um, number one so is... Wahadat al-Wajud uh, is a idea that uh, scholars of the past came up with you, you can actually go into that but I'm just saying this is we're talking about Allah now okay so yeah please um, so there's two sifat of Allah and there's also an ayat of the Quran brother you might know it Umar, uh, Umar uh, brother Umar but um, uh, it, it mentions that there's two sifat of Allah which is rahim and il right rahim and il which encompasses everything it encompasses everything. And so what that means is when something has wujud, it is because Allah had rahim upon it, right? Nothing, if Allah didn't have rahim upon something, it doesn't have wujud, right? It's be wujud, right? It doesn't have wujud. And the same thing, if Allah has ilm of a shay, then that shay has wujud. It has, it has hakim. <coughs> If he knows it, then it exists. If he doesn't know it, it doesn't exist, right? right. So and I'll add that, to that, that everything Allah created is mumkin, mumkinat. Meaning there's no, it's not wajib wujud, right? It's not necessary for me to exist. It's not necessary for you to exist. We're just possibilities. And out of all the things Allah could have created, he knew what, uh, he knew the things he could create that he didn't create. He chose specific things to create out of everything he could create. And I think that's like mind boggling when you think about that, like in terms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So yes, if something has a is given existence, this is out of Allah's mercy. Okay. Now you'll see how, how all this ties into history and uh, Islamic eschatology and the unfolding. You'll see how this is. This is going to be maybe a few series, but it's going to be inshallah ta'ala really well worth watching. Uh, yes, please continue. Yeah, and it will be wealth work because it will be comprehensive, systematic from first principles to final actionable action steps, you know, it will be the whole gambit and it will be very orderly presented. So it, it's worth going through the whole thing. Okay, so coming back. So we that, that's basically all I wanted to say about Wahadat al-Vajud. And the, also from Wahadat al-Vajud, you find this perspective that if anything has baka in the world, if it has baka in the world, then it is because there's some foundational hakikat in it, right? So for example, a uh, feminism, right? Like feminism, a lot of Muslims don't like this idea or whatever, but there is some foundational kernel in it uh, on the basis of which Allah is giving it baka over time. It is an isla of something else, you understand? And until that other thing has pure, has isla, this will continue to have baka, right? Right. So I'll put this in Dark Sub's words. Uh, you know, he that even falsehood needs many times a leg of truth to stand on. Mm -hmm. Right. So if feminism is false overall, but it still is has something in it uh, that allows it to continue ride on some truth that rides on some truth. Right. Uh, nothing can be completely false. Uh, it, even shaitan needs to use something true to, uh, you know, do what he does. So anyway, please continue. Um, so I think from here, the next step would, um, brother, how, how good is your understanding of falsify khudi, brother Omar? Oh, no, I love falsify khudi. So for me, then would you say a little bit about falsify khudi? That, that would be the next step to the next first principle. So let me ask you this question, okay? Uh, what is the difference between falsify khudi and actualization? Self-actual, like Maslowian yes. self-actual? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I don't know if you know this, Maslow was an atheist, right? And okay. so uh, Maslow was an atheist. So I don't know exactly what his philosophy of being was, you know? And I tend to think if you read the, the last book by Maslow, which wasn't completed, The Furthest Reaches of Human Nature was his third book, but he never finished it. Okay. And, it, and in it, it, it is like one of those books that I've like, I've read like a thousand. I love this, whatever it is. It's incomplete, but it's beautiful. And it's basically, I relate Maslow more to Wahadat al Wajud because he's basically talking about insanic kamal type of attributes and self actualization. And so does and Nietzsche he, in his Superman. So this idea has been there. You know, this is also the result of evolution, right? 
So this kind of like this idea of irtiqa, this idea of like, we are at the top, right? Yeah. Where man basically becomes God in a sense. Uh, but falsify yeah, uh, is kind of like the, in, in a sense, it's like that, but it's also the opposite of that, right? It's just, how do you mean, how is it the opposite? It's the opposite because um, to be God, you're relying on external uh, confirmations. Whereas to be a servant uh, of God, you're really looking, diving inside and uh, being, uh, you can say, finding your, yourself, you know, finding your own morality, finding God within you. Find, you know, like uh, Dark Sub talks about the moral law within when he talks about Kant, you know. <laughs> so kind of like that, that you've reached, you have actually uh, examined yourself <laughs> internally. And if you do, you'll find morality within you. And if you do, you'll find, uh, you'll find the day of judgment in a sense that, you know, this idea of karma, right, in, in, in you, right? Um, you'll find uh, God within you. Um, you'll find that uh, how uh, lonely we are and how we're just looking for distractions from not being, from not, you know, not being alone. And so all these things, uh, but then Iqbal also takes it to the point of how this, like finding yourself uh, in the real sense of the word and, and I attach the idea of falsafai khudi with the idea of Iqbal's idea of mard the moment, right? So that's like the, so that's like falsafai khudi is like almost like the process, internal process, and mard the moment is like the result. <laughs> and uh, I also compare it with the idea of fatua. I don't know if you've heard of that, but Islamic chivalry. Uh, <laughs> it is the, it is the other side of the sabuf, which is the sabuf would be more like okay, you know. I've done you wrong, I forgive you, kind of. Uh, but uh, fatua was like the warrior aspect of this, is that uh, we're going to clean ourselves and serve other people, purify ourselves, and uh, we're going to stand up for justice. So it's like the more, uh, it's more the revolutionary side of the subwoof, if you can say. So, إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدَى The ayan stood kahaf. So, uh, and, and I think that's what the end times kind of like calls for, but that's a whole different discussion we can have. Um, because as you know, in Islamic history, uh, there's always been this kind of like, do we stand up for the truth or we just be patient with what yeah. Allah is doing, right? So this kind of like yeah. this dichotomy that's always existed, even uh -huh. amongst the very best of the best people, right? So you have like Nafs Zakiya on one side, you have Zainul Abidin on the other side, for example. So uh, you have this dichotomy. Um, but, okay, I don't want to go into that too much right now. So going back to- That's where what I mean by Islamic realism and Islamic idealism, is re it's related to that. Um, I, I want to go a little bit back to Molana Rum and relate him to Iqbal a little bit. With Molana Rum, you have um, this sense where there's the muannis and the muzakka, right? And so the muannis relationship to Allah is taslim. You surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then you also have this like yoga is like the muzakkir attitude where you're going to attain wujud by your own mushakkat, right? You're going to violently and aggressively and you're going to attain wujud by your own efforts, right? This is kind of the yogic path, right? In contrast to which you have uh, bhakti in Hinduism and you have tasawwuf in Islam where you have the feminine relationship with Allah and you don't take wujud by your own, you receive wujud. The closer you get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through ishq of Allah, the closer you get to him, he, by becoming close to him, you receive your, your vajud from him, mm. right? But the different, in, in yoga, they have the siddhis, they get these magical powers to do whatever they want to do. But in, in, in uh, we have karamat, you know, we get what Allah gives us. We don't take anything. Allah gives us what he gives us. It's more passive. It's more receptive, right? Okay. So, um, what a, so what was the next step? Um, so you were asking me about Khudi, right? And by the way, on Khudi, on that, uh, part of that is what you're saying, which is that you try to imbue the divine attributes, uh, whatever 
I mean, that's not possible, but you try to do that, that, you know, to the point that you have this kind of like, uh, uh, kind of like the divine attributes then manifesting in your personality. Mm -hmm. I think that's the objective, but the question is, how do you attain it? Do you do it like you, you cultivate those yourself or do you try to worship a love so beautifully that you receive those from the, from the, um, what's the word? Uh, the karam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You receive them from Allah or you try to attain them yourself? Which attitude I think is an important question. Sometimes it's a gift and sometimes it's earned. Okay. You know. Okay. Um, are we, do you want to move on to the next phase? I think or that uh, Dr. Sub. Uh, Dr. Sarm, he once said to us that, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like Abu Bakr and Umar were gifted to the Prophet, right? Mm -hmm. But Ali, he raised Ali himself. Mm -hmm. So there's like an advantage and a disadvantage in a sense, if I can use those words in these cases. But, you know, there, there's, there's something Ali got that growing up with the Prophet that no one else can get, right? And at the same time, uh, Abu Bakr is like a gift from Allah to him from the very beginning. And then same There's thing a place for both. Right, exactly. So the, I, I, societies are very much like human beings. So I, I, I'm relating that in that sense that the individual gifts we get, sometimes they're earned and sometimes they're gifted. But there are definitely moments where you have to earn things and there are definitely moments or phases depending upon where you are. You have to beg Allah to take you to the next level. Sometimes you have to do hard work to get to the next level. Uh, it kind of like a bust and, uh, you know, uh, uh, like uh, the club, it bust almost. And it's like Qiyamul during the night and then Mujahida during the day, you know, so there's, it's also that. That's type right. Of yeah. There's both. There's a balance, you know. Yes. I, I would still emphasize, though, in 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 Deen, in our Deen, uh, the the slim, the oneness way, that the the slim is ghalib, right? We have to surrender to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. The qiyamul layl is the more important thing, and it's not like mujahida isn't important. It's just that the mujahida wouldn't mean anything with the, without the without the worship, without the ubudiyah, without the taslim, right? Because we would be just like any, everyone's making mujahida, you know, Every, everybody's making mujahida for something. Yeah. So if we did not have the taslim motivating the mujahida, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be any different. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Sarim al used to talk about the different levels of jihad, like jihad al-baqa versus, mm -hmm. you know, the different types. And so everyone's doing struggling, right? Uh, what's interesting, I'll just throw this caveat into this uh, whole conversation, even though we're going to, guys, we're going to move towards history and Islamic eschatology, but you have to let us <laughs> unpack things. So, because I think the brother wants to establish certain foundations on which we're going to move. So, but I wanted to throw this, like something from the outside, which is uh, one of my sheikhs, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Mustafa said to me that there, there are those people who just surrender, right? They just surrender. And those people that just, he's talking specifically in the context of Islamic law, keep this in mind, okay, from the perspective of Sharia and how you look at the asuls versus the Sharia kind of. So he's like, but then there are those people that look for the hikmah. So just as an example, like he was giving me a similar example, I think is that, you know, if you're, if you're in the desert or if you're in the cold, is it sunnah to wear a white dress like the Prophet did, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Or is it sunnah then to wear a black dress? Because the Prophet wore white in the desert. So you're looking at the wisdom. Okay, why did he wear white? Okay, he wore white in the desert for these reasons. So in the cold, you'll do the opposite to absorb energy. So you're wearing dark clothes. Is that the sunnah? Or is the sunnah to do exactly what the Prophet did in uh, a cold weather? And, and he was saying, well, people that have taslim are just going to do whatever the Prophet did without any question. And there's a certain, you can say, lazza, a certain uh, uh, pleasant joy in doing that, right? A certain joy in obeying the Prophet without question. 
And then, but there's a different type of lazza that when you ask about, okay, what's the wisdom? What am I really learning from this? So I would like you at some point, uh, because me and you are both that generally look at the wisdom of things, you know. So where does that fit into in regards to tasneem versus hikmah? Keep that in mind, maybe. I'd, see, I'd like to see what you say. Definitely. Um, and I think to respond a little bit to that is khulus and niya, right? Uh, if you really have tawheed, perfect, khulus and niya uh, is more important than the partic- getting the fiqh right, right. Because if you have khulus and niya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide you into the most uh, accord with the sunnah. Right? And it, it's the niya and, and the attempt that is ultimately more important than getting the fit perfectly right. So uh, that, that would just be like a preliminary kind of sensibility I have in response to that. Okay. All right. So uh, you talked about khudi. And mm-hmm. okay, so where do you want to take this next? Okay. Next, I, I do want to get this particular into like uh, Hegelian dialectics and something called integral theory and then Eurasianism. So we're starting to get closer to actual history. Um, a lot of my mm-hmm. listeners are, are familiar with Dugan and the whole okay. Eurasian thought. Okay, yes. Okay. Do you want to say something about uh, Iqbalian dialectics or Hegelian dialectics or would I do No, so? Bismillah, I'll let you do it. Okay, Bismillah. So Hegelian dialectics is basically this idea that there's a process. I'll just say that Iqbal was influenced by Hegel. Yep. And Iqbal has his own sense of uh, dialectics. He just has a sense that the dialectics of the universe are naturally going toward uh, in Nabi Sal- the nur of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Anyways, right. Um, so, so but, um, the way I'll put it, if since you mentioned the prophet, that we're going to try everything and end up at the door of the prophet. We're yeah, going to try yeah. communism, socialism, democracy, all different types of things, and then you'll have nowhere to go. Right, but the door of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is okay. Please, yeah, add add to that. Yes. Yeah. So, so pl- the, the I would add though uh, is that that the dialectics can only approximate. Right, the dialectics can only approximate. We can asymptotal. I don't know if I'm saying that, but you asymptotally approach uh, the nur of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But ultimately, we from a material universe cannot ascend unto God. Revelation must descend. Mm-hmm. And that's the whole point of the revelation and the Nabuwa and the Risala is that the, the dialectic could proceed forever and it would get closer and closer and closer and closer forever, but it could never ever quite attain what we can have deducing from revelation, from what he coming down. Right. Anyways, right. So just to uh, go into- That's the because dynamic. whatever solution we come up with will have bring its own problems and that will continue- <laughs> forever without revelation yeah every new new synthesis will always have an antithesis to it yeah. for that process will continue forever so just to quickly review the hegelian dialectic everything has there's a thesis then there's an antithesis and there's a synthesis like we've already discussed iqbal and what hegel would say there's some ideal hegel would say there's some sort of ideal that this thesis antithesis process is moving us toward iqbal is just particular that that is the nur of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so we'll move on past that and we'll get to ken wilber ken wilber is an american so just, just stop there for my audience let me explain that so an example of that could be and you can um you know jump in any time to give your perspective but an example of that could be okay so we had kingship but kingship so that's the uh thesis right so there's kingship and then kingship has its problems so kingship created democracy uh or capitalism or it created this other side but we saw that this side has problems which marx talked about and then this side was the antithesis of kingship so there is something, uh, something here, and then it produced something somewhat better here, but this is still not perfect, still man-made. So then the anti, uh, the, so now this is the thesis and it creates an antithesis of communism, Karl Marx, for example, right? And then now we've gone on from, from communism to something like socialism that's trying to like combine the, the two. And then we're gonna learn, oh, well, maybe this doesn't work that well either. 
um, I don't know. So anyway, yes, please. I'm just giving an example of what you were talking about in terms of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And, and there's a difference, like I'll just add, since you mentioned communism and that dialectical process, that there's also a difference between a Hegelian dialectic and Marxian dialectics, where Hegelian dialectics is like, it's teleological, there's some purpose, there's some ultimate ideal that's being realized on a metaphysical, idealistic sort of level, and in in um, Marxian dialectics, it's a material process, right? There's an inherent uh, dialectical procedure that's implicit within matter itself, and it proceeded to proceed, produce life, it proceeded to evolve, it proceeded to um, create human beings, it proceeded to create capitalism, it's proceeding to create communism, and it'll proceed to create something else, and it's purely a material it's like within matter itself. There's no ideal, there's no objective. It's this material unfolding process, right? So those are just two schools of, that I thought I'd mentioned that. Right, okay. so teleological I, is very important because anything that's teleological, uh, it's almost like there's a design behind it, right? So, uh, so Hegel uh, talks about, so, so basically everything is moving to a certain direction. Right, a certain direction. History itself is unfolding to a certain definite destination. Yes. So this is where it will come in touch with history and then Islamic eschatology and everything. Yes. All right. Bismillah. Bismillah. Okay. So now we're getting closer. Like we saw, we got from the first principles, and we're getting into philosophy, history, and now we're really going into developmental models of human history. So integral theory. There's an American philosopher called Ken Wilber. And I'm, I'm deeply influenced by him and he, his perspectives are non-dual monistic. So he's kind of a type thinker too. And he's also a Hegelian idealist. So he's very close to Dean and his metaphysics, but I'm more interested in talking about his developmental model of human history. So he has this idea called integral theory that human history or human culture goes through stages of development, right? And these stages of development are parallel to uh, human stages of development. So if there's a child, right, he's two years old and he sees something and there's a guy behind a barrier who can't see it and you ask the child, can that person behind the barrier see this thing that you can see? And they will say yes, mm -hmm. because they don't understand that that person has a different perspective. They can't do that yet, right? Mm -hmm. But when he, he crosses four years old consistently, a four-year-old child will say, no, that person can't see it um, because they understand that that person has a different perspective than their own, right? So this sort of perspectival complexification, ability to take different perspectives is a developmental procedure. And so this not only happens in individual people, but happens in cultures. So first you have uh, levels of development. And the first one is like tribal, like a homo sapien natural. Like if you look at, um, you look at gorillas, there's gorilla troops and monkeys have troops, right? Like a homo sapien tribe is kind of like that animalistic, like whales have female dominant schools, right? Killer whales, there's a female, there's a matriarch who's got, but in, in, in homo sapiens, it's a patriarchal structure. It's, it, it's implicit within our organic biology. It's emergent from the individual biology in, in society with one another, that we have a patriarchal tribe. That's how human beings are organized on even an animal level, right? So that's the very first level of development. Um, and then from the tribal level of development, you go into a traditional uh, or a feudal level of development, right? And then from there, you go into a modern, then a postmodern, and then integral. And the integral level of development is where you can look back and you can see each level of development. You can see each stage of development. Now, the reason this is important is important for FIC it's important for FIC because we have to understand that people living in different societies with different psychological structures and different social orders have different hokum. You cannot take a modern hokum in a modern context and put it in a tribal society, right? Um, so so that's that's one model that I wanted to so, share. So let me ask you this, since we're talking about inter, you know, the integral, uh, do you think that we're more consciously different than let's say a person living in a tribal society we think we're more mature we're different what do you mean by consciously different more consciously different like are we more consciously uh Allah Muslim, Allah Muhammad. what i mean by that is that are we more mature 
as as uh, so as we move from tribal society to let's say uh, city states to empires does this affect our image of the self and image of us and our in our understanding of uh, of the world around us? I, I think it definitely does impact our understanding of the world around us. I think our moral nature is the same. Adamic, the Adamic fitra is the same, but the cognitive structure is different. And I don't have a moral value. So one isn't good and the other isn't bad, but it's an, like a child is an evil and a mature person. You know what I mean? It's just a, a different level of maturity. Uh, absolutely it's not um it's not um there's no value on it so but do you think that uh, that a person living in the modern times is smarter than the person that's living in the tribal times not smarter but mature more mature it's not better or worse it's just more mature it's a developmental process is what I'm saying. Like a 60-year-old versus a 20-year-old. Is one better or worse? No. Right. So I'm not, when I say more mature, I'm not saying better. Do you understand that? I'm just saying more mature, mm. cognitively. Right. So uh, now let me ask you, what does that mean for Prophet Muhammad to be the last prophet in terms of history and maturity and like the collective conscious well i would say there's no one more mature than the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam in ever there's no one more perfectly mature than him so i would say that he had his level of cognition or development was like integral it was the most possible a level of maturity that's possible and so when we're following the sunnah most fully um, we have the ability to relate to people at their, like that's one of the sunnah, right? Like to relate to people or speak to people at their level of understanding, mm. their level of development, their level of maturity, right? Mm. And that takes integral maturity. You have to be able to understand where the other person is at, even if they're they're not as mature as you. And only someone who is at an integral level of development can speak to a tribal person, can speak to a modern person, can speak to a postmodern person, can speak to every level of development without being condescending. It's not that I'm better than you because it's not that. It's just that I can relate to you and I can relate to the other person. Whereas a tribal person will villainize a modern person and a modern person will villainize a tribal person okay, and a postmodern person. A postmodern person will villainize a modern person, which we see in America, by the way, right? Yeah, All right. over the place is yeah. like yeah. total villainization. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Sutil Kahaf, you know, also brings this point out that the people that couldn't talk, for example, can have different meanings, but one of the mean they didn't understand language is one meaning, but they were primitive people. And so he left them, right? So this is like the mercy uh, in a sense, whereas you have America that will give them clothes to get smallpox, right? To, to dominate and to take advantage of the weak. Uh, whereas the Prophet Wasallam obviously didn't do that. Um, so, okay, so that's, that's a very good point. Um, okay, please continue. If I could just uh, insert like the in Afghanistan right now, right, uh, the Taliban and everything that's happening with them. So obviously, um, maybe they're religious to some degree or not that they're, maybe they're sincere, although more seems sincere, but, um, you know, their maturity level obviously is, is an issue, right? right? Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Right. So, so that's because, an that, I mean, uh, Dr. Simon and I also mentioned this in different ways. Um, but the most obvious, I mean, you know, he gave the example that I gave them money and they're like, what are we going to do with this money? There's no banks. So, you know, so, um, I don't know if that's an example of that, but, uh, another example of that could be that, you know, they were saying they were having shura meetings on what should be the color of the shirt of the cops. You probably remember Dr. Sub saying this at some point, but, uh, but you know they were they were discussing so these are the issues they're discussing in their top level shura yeah. right 
So the, I mean, a, a person with the sensibilities of the age, let's put it that way, the age, right, of the, of the times, that wouldn't be a priority for him. But because they're a tribal society, they're, they have no choice but to think within the tribal yeah. uh, framework. And it's not a philosophical issue. It's not like they have philosophical convictions that they're limited by. It's psychological constraints. You know what I mean? It's just the very nature of their psychology. They cannot, uh, you can't, it's, it's their sense of self. You understand what I'm saying? It's not like they're choosing that or they're philosophically like limited by their convictions. It, it just, they don't see anything else. That's the way they look at the world. That's the way they see things. Mm. And it's also the way the nature of order within tribal society. So it's just not the individual psychology, but there's a corresponding order within which they live, a social order. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, they can't, um, uh, they can't trans, like, you know, the FedEx symbol, you know, the FedEx symbol. Have you ever, seen, was there a time where you didn't see the arrow? I guess. You know, you know there's a, and there's a moment you see it, right? So they're in this phase where they can't see the arrow. You know what I mean? They're just not at a point where they can see the arrow in certain ways. Okay, interesting. Okay, so, okay, please continue. So we talked about Iqbal. We talked about the irtiqa or the uh, teleological evolution that Hegel talked about specifically, right? So, okay, so where do we go from there? Okay. Um, the next phase I would say is, uh, for me, there's a, a zodiac between Ken Wilber and uh, Dugan, right? Uh, there's a zodiac between them because- uh, By zodiac, he means the two come together as a complementary, uh, complementing uh, philosophies. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so because, uh, you know, Wilber is oriented around time like the, the development over time. And I think um, uh, Dugan does a good job of talking about nations as an idea in the mind of God, which is a very orthodox idea. I think it's a pretty Islamic idea also. Um, and I think there's a complementary because uh, complementariness because uh, Dugan does a good job of respecting the nation and the civilization as a product of the creativity of God. You know, uh, you know, it's it's a function of the land, the geography, the constraints, the economic constraints, the relationship with neighboring nations, the region, language. You know, he does a good job of that. But then there is a sort of development over time that is happening, right? So I think these to complement each other really, really well, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the deen doesn't come to erase the subjectivity of a nation or the culture of a nation. Deen comes to set the rules within which culture can exist, mm. right? It's not trying to eradicate culture. And so that's why I also think uh, Lutheran, like even um, the Quran itself is responding within a rivaya of Vahi, right? It's responding to the Torah and to the the tarifat of the rabbi, uh, rabbis and it's responding to Christianity. So it's responding to something and the Lutherans have this attitude within Christianity where a tradition may need to be reformed in the light of reason, but it is not to be rejected wholesale. Mm. Right. Yeah, I mean, about culture, right? If you go to China, you find a different version of Muslims, for example, or Africa or Indonesia and Malaysia and Saudi Arabia. I mean, they and American Muslims or American Indian Muslims, they all have the principles of Islam, but they also have their own cultures. And uh, I think that's very important to, to kind of like uh, understand, especially in these times where cultures are clashing and uh, people are confusing religion with culture and all these different things are happening. But, and then the other important point you made, um, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, the one you just made right now, but please continue. Hello? Brother, um, you, you have Dugan. Um, I would be interested in hearing you speak a little bit about Dugan. What value about him? appreciate about him? Well, he believes, he doesn't believe in a unipolar world where America is on top or the West is on top. And there's only going to be Western hegemony and Western culture and Western entertainment. And things have to be done according to, you know, our democracy and our liberalism and our concept of women. Uh, Dugan comes from a world where women do hijab. 
for example. The women, they were covering over uh, themselves in the church. So he is uh, very much for, okay, let, let's have every civilization uh, equal, equal, all civilizations are equal on the table, so to say. And so they're against this. And, and a lot of this war with Ukraine has to do with this, that it's, it's Western hegemony versus uh, a multipolar world where Russia is trying to engage uh, politically um, China, the Muslim world, um, and, and countries in Africa, Latin America. And even though Russia is stronger, but he treats the other countries like they're equals. Like, what are we, can, what can we do? And what's important about Dugan, Dugan is like the Iqbal of Russia. That's his like position as a philosopher. He is literally shaping Russia's own self image using his philosophy. And the same way Iqbal did for Pakistan in a sense. So, uh, and, and, and so Putin in a sense of long-term is not so important because statesmen will come and go, uh, but the philosophies remain. And so he literally sees the West as the antichrist. He said this in a recent interview. Uh, he's completely, he's, he's anti-liberalism. He's anti, um, you know, just anti everything, anti-individualism, anti-liberalism, anti-communism, uh, anti-capitalism, you can name it, he's against it. Um, so he, he, he gives a, a, a fresh breather for Muslims that are in philosophy and, and, and it's not, it's, it's a good, he's a, he's a breath of fresh air for Muslims that are interested in philosophy and are able to create, he's able to criticize Western philosophy. I mean, he stood with the best of the best and debated with them and uh, really gave them a hard time. I loved his interview with Fukuyama on the Canadian show. It was pretty uh, cool. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so um, I so think all the these, you know, taking Iqbal, taking Dugan, uh, taking a few other people in my mind, uh, a big portion of Islamic Renaissance could be done just based upon what's already been taking, integrating what's already there. And, and regarding Islamic Renaissance, see, for me, for the ecumenical reconciliation of Muslim ideologies, and Jadid al Makalam and Islamic Renaissance is all related. Right? Yes, like the, the, the yeah. internal debates between Shia and Sunni uh, are actually, in my view, like Muta, for example, I'll admit I'm a little Shia leaning in, in my figure on that because I believe in evolutionary biology. And Molana Mwadudi himself was a little bit Shia in his fic around, around, around Muta. Right. And so I think there's a lot of issues that are within the debate between Shia and Sunni when we produce a very rigorous and coherent Jadid and Mekalam, we will transcend a lot of that in the final age. Um, so I think those, the ecumenical, again, the ecumenical reconciliation, Muslim ideologies, Islamic Renaissance, and Jadid and Mekalam, these three are like inextricably, inex I think that's how you say it, were uh, inextricably. They, they cannot be separated. They're inalienable from one another. I don't know if I agree with the muta aspect you're saying, but I'll take it. I'll I'll do that wheel of what you're saying. Okay. Which is that mamalakat aymanuhum is going to come again, and when that comes, that will be a type of muta because you have to do something with the women that are prisoners of war. And that's going to be a bigger, I mean, you think prisoners of war was an issue in the past. It's going to be a way bigger issue in the armies that have full loads of women now. Can you explicate your disagreement with, the, with what I said about Muta? So Muta being that you can marry somebody for an, a limited number mm -hmm. of time, right? So prisoners of war women have the same process. They're made mahram to you to a certain point after which they can move on. So this is the 
that wheel I'm doing for you, <laughs> or you could say uh, where we can agree. That wheel for me is it that big of a deal? Like, is it? No, it's not a big uh, deal. Okay. Cool. Generally, for me, uh, you know, talking about Dr. Rahman Rahmatullahi, he used to say that if there is a clash between what is maqul and what is jamhur, then he said, uh, stick with what is jamhur until you resolve this fully. So. Uh, so the jumhur, in my opinion, is that there's no muta. Okay, Imam Malik changed his fatwa on the last day of his life on this issue, as you know, probably you already know since you've studied the issue. So yeah. if there's no, uh, unless your understanding of muta is different than mine, now that's a possibility. I don't. I think we have the same understanding, but uh, that that is a beautiful thing that you just said, and I love that you have more of that sort of knowledge with the tradition um, in in our conversation. When you said um, stick with the jamur until the makul becomes very mubin, right? Yes. Something to that effect, right? So um, I I would maybe agree with that principle. That's the Lutheran uh, sensibility that I was speaking to before, also. But um, I would say that. The makul is clear here. It is mubin, <laughs> like for me, because um, just to speak, we're here, so let's just a minute on it. Um, for me, evolutionary biology is no longer a theory. It is a mushayda because you can look at the organisms which have very short lives and they produce generations every hour, every day, like very quickly, and you can see irtaka happening, you know, to some degree. And so for me, evolutionary biology has a certain, uh, it's thabit to some degree in, in my mind. And so um, if you look at animals, the it's very clear in almost all species that the sexual drive is stronger than the survival drive. Many males are willing to sacrifice their own individual bodies in order to reproduce. And that occurs in many, many animals, right? And so the sexual drive is more stronger in a male body than it is, than survival is. So in that case, if Nika oh, is obviously- You're saying survival is more, uh, you're saying survival is- Secondary to reproduction. Secondary to, to the drive of sex. To reproduction, yes. Please with freud on that huh you would agree with freud, freud on that then the well, greatest impulse of man is sex i'm not a big freudian like i'm not in his tradition or anything i'm coming from evolutionary biology but i may agree if that's what he's saying like uh, it, yes the reproductive drive is dominant over the survival drive in almost all cases mm. And so if that is if that is the point, if that is true, then in, in Molana Modudi has a beautiful, like he wrote it out really well in English. He says something like, um, to the effect of where like, um, yes, uh, Nika is preferable, right? Of course, Nika is the default. It established sociological order, Islamic sociological order. That's what's supposed to be happening. But under circumstances where that is not a possibility, that is genuinely impossible, Muta is preferable to zina, is basically what he and I I fully agree with that. I I look at it as a ruksat. Yeah, as that premises I would agree. It's a ruksat in my mind in a fiki, It's a ruksat. There's circumstances under which it, it should be done, but it, it is not something that should be the norm. Okay, okay. I think I can buy that. <laughs> I can buy okay. that. <laughs> but, um, so that uh, but, but in a war situation, it might have to become the norm. Yeah. That would be that would be a rooks that would be where the rooks had applied maybe. Okay. Either we way, got let's go on to the history. <laughs> Inshallah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry we were up there. I don't know how that happened, but okay. Um, okay, moving into the history, we covered Dugan. Okay, so the final thing maybe as the is that we're talking about um, lessons from ecumenical Christianity. So ec ecumenicism is this idea where the same misal we have that the ummah is one body in the hadith, the same misal they had that the, the, the church is the body of Sayyidina Isa al Islam, and the tafarqa is like you know the is like wounding on the body of Sayyidina Isa al Islam, right? And so they want to rejoin the body, they want to reconcile all the Christian churches, and they've been making ideological efforts. And the idea is, look, theology is a thing of conviction, so we can't just arbitrarily say, oh, you're right or we're right or just you know, kind of arbitrarily mix things together it has to be a very careful 
considered gradual process of considering the meaningful differences and how they can be resolved over time, right? And so what I'm saying is they're doing that on a Christological and a theological level. Our differences in the Ummah are just mainly political theory. You know, it's history and political theory are the major difference. There are theological differences. I'm not under, I don't want to understate that, but I also don't want to overstate it. I feel like our differences, uh, especially in Inqalabi Halakat, is much more resolvable. And so when we look at history, when we get finally, I'm sorry for the long introduction, but when we no, get no, into fine. the philosophical dialectics, the objective is to analyze history such that we fully understand from an ecumenical perspective, not from a Shia perspective, not from a Sunni perspective, but from a Quranic Muslim perspective, from a biblical Muslim perspective, like Adam al Islam was a Muslim, Ibrahim al Islam is Muslim. So from a biblical Muslim perspective, what happened? Was the why did the farqa begin in the first place? Why did it cascade into these ten or twelve sects that we've had baka forever? And what is what? How do we move beyond this? Like you know, what is the upward movement of the ummah? So that's what we're going to look at. Um, this is my ecumenical effort to resolve the Muslim differences, the way the Christians are doing. And I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's going to happen within Christianity. Right? I think the Eastern Orthodox are closer to us. The Oriental Orthodox are definitely, the Monophysites are much more closer to us than they are to the real hardcore Trinitarians. And even Eastern Orthodoxy, like the, Rus the Russian church is, is somewhat closer to us in practice or whatever. Um, I don't think it's the reconciliation is not going to happen with Christianity, but I think within Islam, it will happen. I think it, it's supposed to happen. It's not only possible, it's what we're supposed to be doing on a philosophical level to some degree. And my analysis of history, the dialectics of Muslim history is, is a very significant attempt to do that. I, I think I've accomplished it to some degree, but I may be wrong. That might be a little arrogant, but I think I have to some degree at least accomplished that uh, reconciliation of Muslims, which I think is very important. Sorry for going on. No, 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 that's fine. Okay, so where do you want to take the conversation now? Uh, where should we start? Okay, so just to, this is a good point to check in for a second. Um, so I, my next step would be going into the biblical stuff, right? The misal between Adam al-Islam and Sayyidina Isa al-Islam, Sayyidina Ibrahim and Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Imam al-Nas, Sayyid Bani Adam, you know, go into these misal. And once we have the kind of the biblical composition of history, then to go into the dialectics. Um, but it's 8.20 here. Um, <coughs> I've been going on for a while. There's not sound privacy. So I don't know how much longer I can keep going. And probably go for another maybe 15 minutes and then we'll do a session tomorrow, inshallah. Would that be preferable or would that be uh, what's possible for you? I mean, whatever you want. I, I, I have, let's say, a good 15, 20 minutes. But you don't have a strong preference of whether to use it or not use it. Right. Okay. I mean, it's better well, um, if we do use it. The time. Uh, it's better if we do use Okay. If it's better, if, let's say, um, brother, just for respecting other people, let's say 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. From now. Okay. Okay. Um, okay so let's start with Sayyidina Adam al Islam and Sayyidina Isa al Islam. Right. So there's a missile between Sayyidina Adam and Sayyidina Isa al Islam. And it's a very important missile, theologically speaking. Right. It's very and, important. And just for the audience, if you remember the verse of the Quran, the example of, uh, of Isa is like the example of Adam. So, but now we're looking at that from the perspective of history, you can say. Yes. Okay. So um, Adam Islam is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's very meaningful, right? So you and I are the Viladat of our fathers. So we are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it is a fail of an imperfect human being which uh, participates in our creation, right? So we all have the black string of shaitan in our hearts. The What's it called? Do you know the Arabic for it, brother? Yeah, I don't remember the Arabic for it, but yeah, there is a black, yes. That was well, taken that out is, of the prophet. Yes, yeah, so through the zamzam. And, and, we ha and all the anbiya have it removed. But the reason everyone, every uh, son of Adam is born with it is because our fathers are imperfect. So there's an imperfection in the act of our viladat, mm. right? There's an imperfection in the act of our viladat. It's imperfect. And therefore, each son of Adam is born with the black string in his heart after Adam al -Islam. But Adam al himself, even though I believe he's a product of evolution and evolution is in intentional process, it was intended by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he was a creation of Allah. 
it, from the, the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself directly, right? So, and because he was a creation in that way, um, he was he was uh, he was immaculate or perfect when he was born, and that's the hal in which the malaika made sajda to him, right? Mm. Now, Sayyidina Isa al Islam is born the same way, right? Because he's not being created through a product of evolution, but would, would he's no father, so there's no act of vilada. It's he's directly a tahlik of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala again, mm. directly. So he's the second Adam. Uh, I'm wondering how that's impacting you so far. So that's interesting because uh, there is an, in the case of Isa Islam, there is the natural aspect of having a mother, mm-hmm. but then there's like no father, right? So it's like the mixture between Alim uh, al and Alim al in a sense, right? So then if the example of Adam is like the example of Isa Islam, then you would also assume for Adam that he was also kind of like there was a takhliki aspect there, right? And then uh, the Alim al-Amr also in this case uh, intervened to create Adam alayhi So that's mm-hmm. that in, that opens very interesting doors, right? Mm-hmm. Because then that begs the question, okay, what was the takhliki aspect? How far did this evolution, quote unquote, go? Mm-hmm. Um, and then where does or the Alim al-Amr come into this? Mm-hmm. process uh, and also by going back to the idea of that you know the the viladat is not the fail of the mother right it's the fail right. of the father yeah. right and so because isa al-islam doesn't have anyone does not have a father right uh, the act of his creation we don't have it's not vilad we don't use that the christians use that word we don't use that word but the act of his creation is a direct fail of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Right. And so um, uh, th- there's a perfection to that. So the other Anbiya are, are made Salim by their hearts being washed. Right. The mm-hmm. other Anbiya are made Salim uh, for Nabuwa and Risada by their hearts being washed of the black string. But Sayyidina Isa al Islam is born in that kafiyat. Mm-hmm. Right. Because he's a direct creation of Allah. Mm-hmm. And that has significance, that, that yeah. there's more significance to that. Um, and what I'll do here to, to finish the video, instead of going into anything else, now I'll do a missile between Sayyidina Isa al-Islam and Imam al-Mahdi. Okay. Does that sound okay to finish okay. the video? Sure, sure. At, at this point, um, that there's a missile between Sayyidina Isa al-Islam al-Masih and al-Mahdi, right? So in one way, the Ummat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the missile of Ummat Musa. In the other way, it, the Ummat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the missile of Millat Ibrahim. Mm-hmm. Right. So here we're looking at the missile between Ummat Musa and Ummat Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And um, in Ummat Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Imam al Mahdi has the same role which in in Ummat Musa Sayyidina Isa al Islam had. Right. He's the final in the final days of the Ummah. He's this revivalist figure to come to 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 finish the work. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, within Millat Ibrahim, I don't know how much I can get into the missile with Millat Ibrahim. Uh, uh, the, the missile of Imam al Mahdi is actually Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself. Okay. The way right. Sayyid, I get it. Sayyid, right. Sayyid, okay. I get that. Um, do you get that? Do you yes. want to explain it or should I? So, uh, I get that uh, from many different perspectives, but if you're looking at the framework from, Ad, from Ibrahim, and Ibrahim did a dua, oh Allah, raise amongst them a prophet who will recite to them the ayats of the Quran, right? So now from Prophet Ibrahim's dua is accepted and the result is Prophet Muhammad. Okay. All the other prophets were a gift. But he did dua for Ismail's progeny, basically, in there. <laughs> so, yatlu alayhim min anfusihim, right? So from amongst those people over there. And so now the prophet is doing the same thing. He's like Ibrahim and saying, let there be somebody from my progeny who will do the same thing. And so that is what Durud, in a sense, the Durud that we give is a is that Abrahamic uh, framework, right? Mm-hmm. Now, uh, the other framework you gave is that Prophet, uh, uh, sorry, the Mahdi is like Isa, والسلام, in a sense that the first prophet of an Ummah, which is Prophet Muhammad or Prophet Musa, right? And the last prophet of an Ummah which is Prophet Isa, 
or in this mm -hmm. case, within the framework of the Ummah, the last person, the last reviver is going to be the Imam man. The so he's is. functioning as Isa in that sense. Yeah, right. not that has in Nabua, because for me, Imamat has three darajat. There's Imam, which is Umumi, then there's Nabi, and then there's Rasul, right? So no, we're not making the dawah that Imam Mahdi is anything other than an Imam, but Nabuat and Rasalat itself are darajat of Imamat, in a way. And I know that that's similar to uh, strictly the, uh, Shia theology or something, but I'm not a traditionalist Shia, but I do look at it that way. The Imam is an Umumi word, which Nabuah and Rasala are maksus muqamat of. Meaning somebody can have a daraja of a Nabi, but not be a Nabi. Okay. So, uh, for example... Huh? You're, are you saying... I'm not saying that. Are you saying No, that? I'm saying that. I'm saying that somebody... A reviver, like for example, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Bani Israel. The ulama, the true ulama of my ummah will be like the Ambiya of Bani Israel. They won't have the 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 you can say the station of prophethood, but they have the rank of prophethood. And so another version of the hadith, the Prophet said, وسلم, the only difference between some of the ulama of my ummah and the anbiya of Bani Israel will be the, the nubuah will be between their ribs, but it will not be given to them. So this, I, there's a difference between ranking on the one side, closeness on the other side, and position you're given on the other side. So, for example, if you look at Sutul Maryam, for example, it'll say uh, Rasul and Nabiya, like this kind of like duality of these titles. Now, in terms of rank, all the Sahaba were as sabiqun as sabiqun. They were all Siddiqeen. They were all of the highest. But personality-wise, they were different. Some was Omar was very outgoing. He was a sh sh amongst the Shahada. Ali was very outgoing. He was amongst the Shahada. So, so there's this kind of it's it's it, this is a whole my own under uh, taking some of Jung's works and applying it upon Quran, including what Dr. Sarmad has said. But there is a difference between somebody can be close to Allah and still not have a very high position because of some act he did. So Allah brings him close. But another person can have a, a, a high rank, like he's a Rasul. But another person can still be closer to Allah. And so these, like, this is why the term Abduhu is very important. Because that is what signifies his closeness to Allah. Abduhu, you know, his exclusive servant, which is a title given to no other prophet of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's, there's a, there were many people in this ummah, you can say that they had the, 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 not position, not position, but the rank of equal to or higher than a prophet. But they didn't have the position of being a prophet because there couldn't be. So this is kind of like uh, one way of looking at it. So uh, how do you feel about ending it there, brother? Okay, that's fine. Inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakumullah um, khairan. So just like... Uh, Many of the last shower of the Ummah, many people will be like the Sahaba, but they don't have the rank of the Sahaba. Meaning they don't have the position of the Sahaba, but they may have the, uh, even though they don't have the position, but their rank, meaning in terms of good deeds, may be close, similar. Anyway, so we will continue tomorrow, inshallah, if Allah wills. Brother, are you going to stay online for a second after we finish the recording? Or? Yes, yes. We'll talk, inshallah, in just a few minutes. Like, I'm going to... So, inshallah, everyone, stay tuned. We're going to have session number two tomorrow. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. I hope you found this interesting. Assalamu alaikum.